Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome back to New Books in History, a channel of the New Books Network. I'm your host, Zeb Larson, and I'm here today with Dr. Richless Lockman to discuss his book, First Class Passengers on a Sinking Ship. Dr. Lockman examines some of the history and explanations behind great power decline, hegemony, and imperialism to better understand how that might be applied to the United States in the 21st century. Uh, Dr. Lockman, thank you for coming with us today to the New Books Network. Your first chapter, and I think this is a really interesting way to frame this question, because there's a lot of discussion, um, even now in the popular press, which actually sort of amazes me about this question of the United States as an empire. But you you complicate that by dealing with this question of empire versus hegemon. What's the distinction and how does it apply to the United States? Well, there have been a, a lot of empires historically, but, you know, as far as, you know, I can see there've only been three hegemons. And the way I define hegemony is that it's the ability, you know, not just to exploit other lands, but rather it's such a degree of power that it allows the hegemon to really set the rules of global behavior in economics, in geopolitics. And, you know, so clearly the first two hegemons, the Netherlands and Britain, had empires and their empires contributed to their ability to build and then sustain hegemony. But, you know, the United States really didn't have a formal empire. At the end of the 19th century, it grabbed a few colonies, but, you know, these weren't significant in terms of U.S. power. So... You know, my interest is really twofold. You know, one, to explain this question of, you know, how did these three places gain hegemony? And then, you know, what led to their losing it? And also to look at the cases of Spain and France that had enormous empires that at various points were the leading military power in Europe, but weren't able to parlay that into hegemony. So it's these you know, different questions that I'm trying to explore. And I do that in part by drawing this contrast between hegemony and empire. Now, in your second chapter, you address basically four different explanations of imperial or hegemonic decline, and, and you sort of take issue with all of them. What do you make, with the, make of them? How would you summarize them? And then how do you differ with them ultimately? Okay, well, the the first one you know, comes out of Pareto and Mosca, the developers of the original you know, theory that looks at elites and says elites are the dominant players in any society. And you know their argument is that initially the elites are aggressive, hungry, and they you know grab power for themselves and build a strong military that's able to conquer other peoples. But then the benefits from this power make the children and the grandchildren of this initial generation of elites soft, and they're no longer willing to defend their empire. And so it declines, and even domestically, they lose power. And the problem with that is that it doesn't really fit the facts that there you know, is a lot of variation in how long elites are able to maintain power, how extensive that power is. And, you know, so you don't have this sort of simple generational explanation for the loss of empire, the loss of hegemony. And then if we look at the second one, it, you know, looks at environment and demography and, it argues that if you have an empire that it's going to, you know, one view is it exploits the natural environment and then the environment's no longer able to sustain that and you get a catastrophic collapse. And the demographic argument is that if you have an empire that brings in resources, people are able to support large numbers of children and this creates a problem 
mainly for elites that you you know you have these limited number of elite families that figure out some system for giving out privilege giving out resources and then they have lots of children and you have too many people chasing after a limited number of positions in government or in business and you have children who lose out and then are angry they've been brought up thinking they're entitled to certain things that they then don't receive and that leads to revolutions and you know again you know these are very broad claims that aren't very good at fitting particular cases so if we look at environment the question is you know why in some cases do societies or the rulers of societies recognize the environmental dangers and are able to respond to it but in other cases they're not you don't always have environmental collapse in fact that's something that's fairly rare and then with demographic increase it certainly does cause disruption you know that i think is a real finding but that doesn't then explain how is that dealt with why do you get revolutions in some cases not in others and when you do get revolutions why do you get these different outcomes it doesn't always lead to a regime that's weaker than before in some cases it creates one that's much stronger the third explanation comes out of world system analysis it was developed by Emmanuel Wallerstein and Giovanni Arrighi and their argument is that you know in over the past 500 years of capitalism that you have tiers of territories at the bottom you have what they call peripheral areas where food is grown natural resources are extracted you have very brutal and oppressive systems of labor control and then at the top you have what they call core regions and these are the ones that are engaged in the most advanced sort of production they get most of the profit that's generated in this capitalist world system and then in the middle you have what they identify as semi peripheral areas where you have the initial processing of these raw goods and you know they are the intermediate points in terms of production and trade between the core and the periphery and then arigi's addition to that is to argue that you also at the top of the core have a hegemon a political unit that's able to order the world system control the financial architecture of global capitalism and even if they're not able to impose themselves militarily upon the rest of the world they have enough military power that will support what he sees as their real authority which comes in the financial realm and you know both Wallerstein and Arrighi argue that the the global capitalism goes through cycles that you have an expansion of global capitalism new areas are incorporated this generates a burst of profits so that overall the world capitalist economy is doing better and but then you have these especially the semi peripheral areas industrializing and so they then compete with the core the rate of profit drops and you have core areas and above all the hegemon shifting into finance and i think this is a, a real finding and an important one and it's one that you know is very helpful to me in my book in addressing especially the united states but also to some degree britain and the netherlands that as finance becomes more and more important that elite achieves a dominant position they in a sense start exploiting the other elites within the hegemon as well as non elites and people in the rest of the world but you know again this can vary a great deal and what i found is that britain really was different from the netherlands and the us that elites there were able to reform themselves and so britain's hegemony lasted a lot longer than that of the netherlands or the us and then the final theory is one that was developed by paul kennedy and they 
1980s. And essentially what it argues is that empires are money losers, that if you have an empire, you have to station troops all over the world. That gets expensive. You know, any military dispute, any rising power anywhere in the world appears to the rulers of that empire as a challenge, as something that needs to be stopped because otherwise it's going to create a military rival. And so military costs go up and up. That becomes a drain on the overall economy. And so then you have decline in production, decline in civilian innovation, and then you have rival societies that do better economically. Well, the problem with that is it's not true. That in fact, the costs of the military you know, don't overwhelm societies. If we look at the United States, you know, again and again we hear the military budget is the highest it's ever been in US in history. This is this you know, horrible drain on the American economy. But as a percentage of GDP, it's been declining really you know, since the 1980s. So you know, the military is not all that significant. And in Britain, they were quite successful at keeping military spending very low. And so the British lost hegemony you know, during a period when military spending was low and to the extent that the British economy fell behind that of the U.S. and Germany, it wasn't because military spending was this huge burden. It had to do with the internal structure of British firms, the sorts of investments that British elites made. And you know, if we look at the first hegemon, the Dutch, they were able to sustain a larger navy than the British, even as they lost war after war. The reason the Dutch lost those wars wasn't because they couldn't afford their military spending. It was because the Dutch political system was fragmented. And in fact, they had seven separate navies, each com commanded by a particular elite. And if one of those elites didn't agree with the foreign policy goal set by the central government, they just kept their navies in port. So most of the Dutch ships actually didn't fight in the wars with the British, and the few that showed up, of course, were defeated. So, you know, each of these four explanations, you know, really is getting at something that's real, but it's, it's not a whole explanation. And in, in fact, we need to look at a number of factors and see how they interact if we want to come up with a good answer. So let's pivot to this question of empire. And that's, that's really um, the third chapter is looking at Spain and France, which, which achieved these enormous empires. And indeed, Spain temporarily can reposition itself at the center of the global economy for the silver trade. But there, there are limitations that you call attention to. What, what, what are those limitations and what lessons can we take away from this in terms of historical experience? I mean, the, the limitation is just because you hold a colony on paper, that you, you know, that Spain could say all of Latin America except Brazil is made up of our colonies, didn't mean that Spain actually could extract very many resources. The way that Spain and also France ruled their colonies was a reflection of the sort of elite relations that operated within those two countries. And in essence, what the kings of Spain and France did was they turned to regional elites and told them, if you recognize our authority, we're going to let you govern your territories as you see fit. And you as you know, our tax collectors will get to keep most of that revenue. And when Spain and France conquered colonies, they made the same deal. They said to the people who went out to these lands and conquered them, you know, all you have to do is say, we're Spanish, we're French, we recognize our king, you know, we're going to plant the flag. But, you know, they had to make arrangements that let these elites keep most of the resources. So with Spain, very quickly, 
the silver that was extracted didn't get sent back to Spain. The local elites kept it and they started doing business with the French and then especially with the British who had much better products to offer, you know, had more ships, were able to ship things back and forth between Europe and the Americas. And so you had these big empires, but they didn't generate the resources that let Spain or France compete militarily within Europe. And even when they were able to do that, it didn't create the sort of economic exchange and development that would have let them develop into real capitalist economies. So the general lesson is don't look at maps, you know, don't say, wow, Spain has conquered so much of the world or in the 19th century. This is impressive. France's empire is second to the British. They must mean that they're the second capitalist economy in the world. It doesn't necessarily work that way. You have to look at, you know, how are these colonies ruled? How do resources get moved from one place to another? You know, does it create openings that allow other capitalist economies to intervene and gain much of the benefit from European or in the current century, American control of large parts of the world. Now, we've talked a lot about the Netherlands. We've sort of teased around there or even kind of been explicit about their success as a, as a true hegemon. What causes their success and then their ultimate decline? Well, in looking at these cases at it's Spain, France, the Netherlands, Britain, and the U.S., and then also looking at earlier empires. What I found is that there are four factors that can block hegemony. You know, any one of these four is enough to prevent an empire or significant military power from achieving hegemony. What the four are is, you know, one is you have a high level of elite conflict in the metropole. You know, so at the center, you have elites that are fighting with each other, you know, unable to reach accommodations that allow them to come up with a unified policy. You know, second is there's a high level of elite autonomy in the colonies. And as we just saw, that was the problem with Spain and France. And even though they had these empires, the colonial elites were able to keep most of their resources. So it didn't really contribute to building up central political power. A third is that you have just a single unified elite in the metropole. You know, so when I looked at the Roman Empire or in the 20th century, the empire that the, was built by the Nazis or at the very beginning of the 19th century, Napoleon's empire, what prevented them from achieving hegemony was that there was a single elite and that then allowed those elites to pursue self-interested policies that prevented the establishment of the sort of economic relations or the type of control over its conquered lands that would have allowed hegemony. And then the fourth is a lack of infrastructural capacity. And, you know, that certainly was the problem of empires before the era of capitalism. You know, they just weren't able to communicate with the lands that they controlled. They weren't able to extract resources in an efficient enough way. They weren't able to supervise the people they put in control in the lands that they conquered. And, you know, so you just couldn't have hegemony. You could have an empire, you know, they might be able to prevent rival military powers from challenging them. Obviously some resources were drawn out. So if we look at the Roman empire, you know, in many ways it was, you know, enormously successful. You know, or the various Chinese empires historically. They were able to maintain themselves for centuries. They were able to extract enough to support giant capital cities. You know, so in the ancient world to have Rome having a million people in it is an enormous accomplishment to be able to bring in food and other resources to feed a million people who are not farming is an amazing thing. But, you know, there wasn't, the degree of communication and control over the conquered lands that would have allowed hegemony. So what I've 
do is looking at these systematically is I try to identify how many of these factors are present in these various countries at different historical moments. And it's only when all four are missing that you get hegemony. You know, so that's my explanation for how the Netherlands, Britain, and the U.S. achieved hegemony, that, you know, so construct a historical analysis of why these four factors weren't present. But then the next question is, how does hegemony disappear? And, you know, the answer is that there must be something about hegemony that leads to a return of at least one of these factors. And in the cases of the Netherlands, Britain, and the U.S., the main one is the first one, that there's something about hegemony, about the resources it brings in, the creation of new elites, either in colonies or as a result of the financial and trade networks that are created by hegemony, that leads to heightened elite conflict in the metropole. And that's what undoes hegemony. So we look, you know, at the Netherlands, the first hegemon, that the political structure that existed there was created out of, you know, two demands on the Dutch. You know, one was they were a colony of Spain and they fought over a number of decades for independence from Spain. And to do that, they had to create military units. They had to find a way to generate resources. And this created a political structure that drew together, you know, these various provincial elites and urban elites into a central government that was able to balance the autonomy that these elites wanted to maintain while at the same time creating mechanisms that allowed them to generate resources, money to build ships, money to buy weapons, money to hire soldiers. And the other factor that generated this sort of political structure is, you know, what we all know about the Netherlands. It's, you know, a land that, you know, is right at sea level, is constantly under threat of flooding and the Dutch you know, were able over centuries to build dikes, to hold back the sea, increase their farmland. And, you know, again, this required central coordination, the raising of resources to accomplish that. So these two struggles against the sea and against the Spanish created a political structure that made it possible for the Dutch to generate lots of resources quickly and this was especially useful in the early stages of European colonization of the rest of the world. And at the beginning, the, it didn't require all that much military force. You know, they weren't fighting other Europeans that had advanced weaponry. They were fighting the people in Asia, Africa, and the Americas who had you know, weapons that weren't very powerful and who could be easily defeated. So at the beginning, the way you grab empires or trade routes was by moving fast. And the advantage the Dutch had was through their struggles with the sea and with the Spanish, they had these mechanisms for building ships quickly, generating money to pay for the ships, pay for the sailors and soldiers who would go onto these ships and send them out around the world. So the Dutch were able to get control less of colonies and more of trade routes. The, the Dutch empire didn't have a lot of land, but it had key forts and trading depots at these strategic locations around the world. And, you know, so that gave them their hegemony because Amsterdam had a great deal of autonomy, it could become the financial center. It was the place of the first real stock exchange in world history. And it also became the banking center. So you had capitalists throughout Europe putting their money into Amsterdam because first of all, it was safe. And secondly, it was efficient. You know, they could settle accounts with people they were doing business with really anywhere in the world, right in Amsterdam. But 
this hegemony heightened elite conflict. That you had the Amsterdam elites becoming more and more powerful because of the money they were making through finance, because they were the key actors in colonial trade, but they then increasingly tried to make demands on the other elites who pushed back. And so you had more and more conflict. And you know, as I mentioned earlier, this was expressed where you had the other elites you know, no longer being willing to send their navies out to fight the battles that the Amsterdam merchants wanted to fight against the British to maintain their financial power and to maintain their control over trade routes. And so the Dutch fought a series of wars with the British. And, you know, while they didn't lose all of them in military terms, they lost enough. And even in the ones where it seemed that they won, they ended up no longer being able to control trade routes. And the British became more and more capable of really building up a parallel system with their own forts and with their own depots. And that eventually overwhelmed the Dutch. Now, in terms of the British, I mean, you've already noted that there is some, there are some quirks in that they were able to better control their own hegemony and elite relationships. So how do you, how do you specifically account for the empire's longevity, but, and then eventual decline? Well, the, the British elite structure was really unique that it, there was a real balance between the landed elite and the rising merchant elite. And, and you had, you know, both in parliament and also through the Bank of England and, you know, various other economic institutions, mechanisms that wasn't so much allowed these elites to compromise, but forced them to compromise. You know, neither could see a viable path to totally dominating the other. And so the conflicts were muted and there were key compromises. And the most crucial one was if we look at Britain's you know, richest colony, India, that at first it, this colony was built in a way similar to what the Spanish and the French did, that a concession was given to the East India Company. This was a private entity that ruled India. You know, it wasn't a British colony. It was a company colony. But over time, the East India Company became more and more corrupt. You had within that company the development of structures that were similar to what were going on in France and Spain, then later the Netherlands. You had particular elites within that company that achieved a high degree of autonomy. They were able to control parts of India, you know, trade in certain goods and just hold these resources for themselves. So the East India Company then came not to have the resources to be able to field an army that would suppress challenges within an India that was strong enough so that rival European powers wouldn't even try to attack India. And the British government and elites back in Britain saw that this was a danger, that the East India Company was no longer able to pay the annual taxes that kept the British government afloat, that was key to the British government's budget. And so the East India Company was nationalized. The other elites came together and you know, said, we have a problem. They developed a solution. And they were able to do that in other colonies as well. So you had, it wasn't that you had everything ruled from London. You know, the British Empire was famous throughout as having a very small civil service. You know, you had, you know, this empire that controlled more than a quarter of the territory on the globe, you know, ruled over hundreds of millions of people and did that with a civil service of under 2,000 people. But, you know, what they did was clever and strategic. You know, they were able to create multiple elites, balance them off, and prevent any of them from gaining total control over any colonies or, you know, any line of business. But, you know, over 
a much longer period of time than for the Netherlands or the U.S., you eventually did have some elites who, you know, were able to gain full control over their businesses, you know, over colonies. And again, as with the Netherlands, finance became more and more important. And so the financial elite overwhelmed the capitalists who were actually engaged in manufacture and they were able to manipulate trade with the colonies to produce these sorts of artificial financial profits even if this undermined the viability of the economies in these colonies. And so British decline happened in the late 19th century. So, you know, there are various scholars who argue Britain maintained its dominance. The only thing that undid Britain was the two world wars. The, you know, the cost of that was just so much and Britain couldn't sustain itself. But what I find is, it happened well before that. It wasn't that a new hegemon achieved that status and overthrew Britain. That in all three cases was a case of the existing hegemon declining and then having a period where you had various rival powers competing to try to take over the powers and economic privileges that the previous hegemon had. It was only eventually that it became clear which one would win out and become hegemonic. So after the Netherlands declined, you had Britain and France competing with each other, and eventually Britain became successful. With the decline of Britain, you had the U.S. and Germany competing, and at the end of the two world wars, it became clear it was the U.S. And now we have, with U.S. decline, it's not at all, you know, certainly China is making in various ways an effort to become the dominant global power. But, you know, for a variety of reasons, it's not clear that China is going to be able to achieve that. And so, you know, we might have a long period of global disorder and, you know, we may not have another hegemon. You know, we could be entering a new era of geopolitics and of the global capitalist economy where we don't have a hegemon. We have a number of regional powers that control certain areas and then are competing financially, militarily, and geopolitically throughout the world with none of them being able to establish a hegemony. So we could have a much more disordered world than we've had in the past. Now, in the chapter that comes after Britain, we, we jumped to the United States. This is where people who are really interested in this question of U.S. decline, I, I think this is, this is where it becomes very, very clear. You talk about shifting elite relationships. You pick up with Kennedy and you trace it basically to Donald Trump. So how do you see elite relationships shift in this period? Well, the, you know, in the, you know, during the New Deal in World War II, a very stable elite structure was created. And this, you know, grew out of the legislation and regulation that was designed to prevent another Great Depression. And the analysis that people in the Roosevelt administration came up with is the Depression was a result of large monopolistic firms that were able to manipulate financial markets, pump up a stock exchange to unrealistic levels, loot firms, and that the answer to preventing that happening again was to have a a heavy regulatory regime. And at the center of that was to really divide industries between national and local firms. So, you know, if we look at banking, what the New Deal did was it essentially looked at the financial sector and said, these are the various things that banks do. And we're going to allow certain banks to do some things, other banks to do different things, and none of them could be involved in the whole range of financial affairs. So, you know, one of the crucial ones was mortgages. It was decided 
this would be local savings and loans. This was who would give out mortgages and national banks couldn't be involved in this in any way. And then there was also the separation of for national banks that would be involved in providing financing for corporations and others that would be allowed to speculate for themselves in various mar- in the stock market and international currency markets. And at the same time, the power of capitalists was balanced off to some degree by powerful labor unions. And so you had the sort of balance. And, you know, I begin this chapter with a quote from Kennedy. And, you know, when he was president, he said, you know, when I was growing up, they were these big ideological struggles. But, you know, we don't have that anymore because the problems we face now are technical ones solved by experts. And, you know, I put that in because, you know, for people living today, you know, that seems, you know, words from, you know, a sort of unbelievable world that, mm-hmm. you, know, you know, not, you know, not just that Kennedy would say that, but that, you know, people would actually believe that sort of, you know, yes, we need to listen to the experts and figure out what the optimal policy is and then follow that. I mean, of course, people did look after their interests, but, you know, there was a high degree of consensus. And there was, you know, a view that the government, you know, was able to regulate the economy. And so if you began to get inflation, there were things that you did. If there was a recession, there were other things that the government should do as there was increasing competition from Europe and Japan after they rebuilt their economies after World War II. You know, there were other policies that you came up with. But, you know, this consensus has been undone. And what I do in that chapter is try to explain how that happened. And there were really two key factors. One was the decades-long decline in unions. So You know, the key force that was able to challenge capitalists and also provided the organizing and financial support for a liberal democratic party was progressively weakened. And the other was mergers. You know, as I mentioned, you know, the key to the New Deal regulatory system was this dividing up of industries between national and local firms. And beginning with Nixon, you had a weakening of antitrust, that firms were allowed to merge that previously been kept separate. And this had two effects. You know, one, it reduced competition, as you got these large firms that controlled more and more of an industry, they were able to impose prices, they didn't innovate so much anymore. They were able to crush rivals. You know, the sort of thing that we see now, especially in the tax sector, where you have these few large firms that really entirely control the industry. And you got a ratcheting effect. You know, as you've got some mergers, the political power of these local firms was weakened because there were fewer of them. You know, the U.S. political system potentially gives a lot of power to local actors. Members of Congress are elected from states and districts. So if you're a capitalist or a union or a group of farmers in a state, you potentially have a lot of power because within a state, within a district, you can elect somebody to Congress And then in Congress, they can leverage that into power over to set the rules to write legislation in a particular industry. We have a long history of members of Congress having enormous sway over a particular policy, over a particular industry, you know, and they achieve that by, you know, horse trading, saying, you know, I really care about farm policy. 
or I really care about what happens to the credit card industry. And if you let me have my way on that, I'll vote for whatever you want that's of concern to you. But as you have these local businesses being merged out of existence, you no longer have this pressure on members of Congress to protect these local industries. And so, you know, then you get laws allowing further deregulation, which allows more mergers that further weakens these local businesses. And, you know, so over a number of decades, you end up in a situation where you have a few gigantic firms essentially regulating themselves and being able to loot the economy. And, you know, for, for me, you know, the sort of emblem of that is Enron, you know, this company that, you know, collapsed early during the George Bush administration from financial fraud. But there was another side to Enron that, you know, they were able to manipulate energy markets and they, you know, got away with, you know, that sort of fraud because they weren't regulated by the national government. Well, you know, what was interesting about that was Enron wasn't just ripping off ordinary consumers. It wasn't that just that, you know, we had to pay three times as much for the electricity to run our air conditioning in summer because, you know, they were able to overwhelm state regulatory agencies and be able to set up markets that, that Enron could then manipulate. They also were ripping off large industrial corporations that needed large amounts of energy. So, you know, this is an emblem of this restructuring of elites in the United States where you, you know, have fewer and fewer corporations. So they're, you know, but they also gain, you know, this enormous autonomy, essentially an autarky, that they're able to control their sector. They're not vulnerable to challenges from other elites or from government regulation. And, you know, they just go ahead and loot. And at the same time, this creates a political paralysis that they're able to block any sort of reforms that might challenge their interests. You know, so, you know, again, you know, this is like, you know, what I observe for these historical cases. You know, we, we know what the problems are. We know what reasonable solutions are, but elites are able to block that. You know, so we look, for example, at health care. You know, it's no secret that the United States spends far more on health care than any other country, either in raw dollars or as a percentage of GDP. And the outcomes aren't very good. Our life expectancy is shorter than lots of other countries, including ones like Cuba or Costa Rica that spend a lot less on health care. We pay much more for medications than any other country in the world. And you can just go down the list and see, you know, how our healthcare system isn't working. And, you know, I let me pat myself on my back. You know, I wrote this, you know, and I'm not the only one who did that, you know, long before COVID, you know, which has exposed the weaknesses in the American healthcare system. Well, why isn't there reform? You know, we know what to do. You know, we can look at any other country in the world and see how they're able to deliver much better health care at a much lower cost. They have a national system. You know, they buy medication centrally, which gives them a lot of leverage against pharmaceutical firms. So they will get low prices. They don't buy medications that don't provide significant health benefits. You know, so why can't we set up that sort of system? Well, we saw that, you know, with Obama. You know, Obama's great achievement was the Affordable Care Act. You know, it's the first time that people under 65, you know, had access to, you know, government guaranteed and, you know, for people without much money, government subsidized health care. I mean, how was Obama able to achieve that? Clinton failed, Carter failed.
you know, Nixon failed, you know, Truman failed, Roosevelt failed. You know, how did Obama do it? Well, you know, Obamacare was structured in a way that guaranteed that none of the healthcare companies would lose money as a result of this reform. In fact, they'd make more money. You know, they'd get customers who were, whose bills would be paid by the government. So, you know, the only way to extend healthcare to people was to go to the hospitals, go to the doctors, go to the drug companies and say, we're going to write this bill in a way that you won't lose anything. In fact, you're going to gain. So the healthcare system has become even more expensive. You know, more and more of the money is used to pay for the profits of these firms, you know, to buy health care that makes money but doesn't really make anybody any healthier. And we can go sector by sector and see this operating. So you know, we pay much more for all sorts of things <clears throat> than people elsewhere in the world. You know, we're unable to set up efficient systems for giving us health care, for buying weapons for the military, for educating our children. And, you know, so all of this, you know, retards the U.S. economy, makes us less competitive, you know, has people who are less healthy, less educated than elsewhere in the world, you know, so none of this is helping the U.S. maintain hegemony. And, you know, it's, you hear a lot of talk now that the U.S. political system is broken, and that's correct. There aren't, it's hard to see how the reforms that so many people recognize as necessary can be produced in a system where, you know, there are all these veto points where it's so easy to gridlock things if there's any threat to fairly small elites, power, and profits. Now, I want to shift a little bit to something that we've alluded to and that you mentioned in the intro of the book, which is that there's a paradox in that the U.S. military is uniquely powerful. This is something that is pointed out and to its critics, they call attention to its budget. But you also know that the U.S. military has a very lousy record in securing victory post-1945. Does that matter? And if so, why does that matter? Well, I mean, it matters because, you know, while hegemony isn't just a matter of conquest or defeating rivals, it <clears throat> has to be backed in the end by military power. You know, there has to be the ability to say, if you don't go along with what we as the hegemon have in mind for how geopolitics will operate, how the global economy will operate, how finance will operate, we can send in troops. You know, we can overthrow your government. We can make you behave in the way that you want. And, you know, the times when the U.S. has tried that over the last I mean, as you point out, basically since the end of World War II, in almost all cases, it hasn't worked out. And so that means the U.S. has less leverage that, you know, countries can thumb their noses at the United States. And to the extent that the U.S. does have leverage, it comes more from non-military means. So how does finance also play a role in complicating and sustaining hegemony? I mean, this is the area where the U.S. maintains dominance, and we've seen that with the 2008 financial crisis and now with the economic problems created by COVID. The whole world, you know, essentially is looking to the U.S. Federal Reserve to create trillions of dollars of money to prop up the global economy and the dollar is the world currency. You know, everything's denominated in it. Various attempts over the years to have the euro or the Chinese currency become a rival global currency you know, haven't happened. 
And so, you know, in a sense, you know, this supports, you know, Origi's world system analysis that the last stage of hegemony is in the financial realm and that this can last well after power <clears throat> in real economic production or in the military have been lost. And we're certainly seeing that with the U.S. So the U.S. is retaining that element of hegemony. And so, you know, it, it leads to a sort of confused world picture that, you know, the United States isn't able to exert its force militarily, you know, except for really small and weak countries. They don't have to worry about U.S. intervention in, you know, most sectors of real production, the U.S. no longer dominates. You know, the internet is really the last one where, you know, the U.S. is leading. And, you know, even in that, China's building parallel internet companies that dominate not just in China, but increasingly are <clears throat> going elsewhere in the world and with something like TikTok into the U.S. too. But in finance, I think we can expect U.S. hegemony to last for a long time. And, and as you know, the world economy becomes more disordered, as we get more and more financial crises, there's going to be a continuing need for the, the power and the quick policy making of the Federal Reserve. <clears throat> so if anything... Other countries that were you know, contemplating boosting their currency, challenging the dollar, or pulling back from that because they worry this is going to create such economic disruption that their country's well-being will be threatened. So I think we can expect to have a world where you know there isn't a hegemon in other areas, but in finance, the U.S. will maintain its dominance. So just to to cap all this off, you end the book, and I, I, I appreciated that you did this by noting that books like this tend to end with recommendations for what we ought to do, and also noting then that these recommendations are very rarely, if ever, actually followed. So what do you offer instead? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, in a sense, the whole book is about you know, why reasonable and potentially effective solutions to decline never get implemented or hardly ever, you know, with Britain being the rare case where there was a period where that did happen. So, you know, I think, you know, what we need to do first of all is figure out, you know, what does happen after decline and see to what extent the Netherlands and Britain, you know, can give us some information on that. And so what I do in the last chapter is first see what happened in the Netherlands and Britain after they lost to Germany? You know, how did they try to fight wars? You know, did income and wealth become more or less equal? You know, were social benefits created? But after doing that, and I point out that in terms of social benefits, it's not really something that provides helpful perspective for the U.S. now because both the Netherlands and Britain declined in an era before you had <clears throat> a view that governments needed to provide a whole array of benefits to their citizens. So, you know, what was created then was very modest, but that doesn't, you know, really tell us what could happen in the U.S. And, you know, I think, you know, what's more helpful is to see did elites further fragment after the loss of hegemony? Was there any sort of popular mobilization? How was that achieved? Because if we're, we're looking at the U.S. future, you know, it's not a question of will the U.S. restore its hegemony. That's not going to happen. The question is, what's life going to be like for most of us? Are we going to be in a country where there's more and more inequality? Are we going to be in a country where 
the standard of living declines. You know, is this going to be a country that gets involved in wars where people get killed, but nothing really is accomplished? And, you know, I think the answer to that has to do with, can there be mass mobilization to challenge these elites? You know, what sort of politics, you know, can be created to challenge elites? And, you know, I don't provide an answer in my book that would require a whole nother book to do that. But, you know, I think the same forces that allow elites to disrupt U.S. politics are going to make it very hard for there to be effective non-elite mobilization. So, you know, it ends on a very pessimistic note, but it's, it's not one that's inevitable. And, you know, the one hopeful thing is that sociologists are really, they're good at explaining social movements when they develop, but they're terrible at predicting when they're going to arise. So, you know, so we don't know, you know, there, there could be, you know, a somewhat happy ending that there could be an upsurge of social activism that can you know, disrupt elite domination. Now, having finished this book, which is, and I can tell, having it's been a long-term project, um, do you have anything else coming up, or are you content to let let current events percolate for a little bit? Well, I'm you know, working on one book that's somewhat related to that, that you know, when I talked about U.S. military decline, a lot of that had to do with the structure of the military, the financial interests of the firms that build weaponry. But another factor that is more and more crucial is the aversion that Americans have to casualties. You know, Americans are not willing to go into wars where a lot of Americans are being killed. I mean, they don't care about foreigners being killed. You know, that there's no attention to. But, you know, if you look, you know, with Vietnam, when the number of American deaths got to 20,000, there was a view, this is too much, this is unacceptable. And it took years for the war to end. In the end, 55,000 Americans died. But, you know, there's a sense, there's a limit. With Iraq, that was reached at 2,000. So tolerance for casualties is decreasing. And so what I'm working on now is a book that tries to explain why that happened and also to illustrate this change in another in a number of ways. You know, part of it is looking at the Congressional Medal of Honor. You know, what is the military itself, you know, through that and other medals and the way that they, you know, describe battles, train soldiers. You know, I show an increasing concern by the U.S. military itself to minimize casualties. You know, then there's also, I look at media depictions of casualties, you know, both in the news, but also in movies, novels, TV dramas, and all of this shows, you know, an increasing concern for protecting Americans, you know, seeing war in essence is not about winning, but about getting Americans home alive. And, you know, of course, you know, one way this is shown is in the concern for prisoners of war. If we look at Vietnam, the POWs became an increasing center of concern. You know, they, you know, and that, you know, that, that's not about winning the war. That's about getting Americans, you know, home alive. And, you know, of course, Nixon created the POW issue as a way of criticizing anti-war people, saying they don't care sufficiently about U.S. soldiers. But this is one of the rare cases of a right-wing political strategy that backfired. The, you know, the real effect that it had was that more and more Americans came to see war as unacceptable if any Americans got killed and the goal of war became getting Americans home rather than winning. You know, and you have this, you know, bizarre symbol of the yellow ribbon, which, you know, of course began during the Iranian hostage crisis and is now used, 
you know, is a symbol of we want our soldiers to come home safely from Afghanistan or Iraq. I mean, if you take it literally, it's, you know, you know, if our soldiers in Iraq are, you know, hostages like the Iranian hostages, well, I mean, who's holding them hostage? It's our own government. Well, I mean, that, you know, I don't think people putting up the ribbon actually think that. It's more just the Americans in danger abroad and we want them to get home safely. Well, if that's the approach, you can't really fight war. So that's what that book's going to look at. And then the other thing that I'm working on, it builds on, you know, this issue of the environment and decline. And, you know, clearly the greatest problem we face is of climate change. And, you know, if that isn't solved a hundred years from now, the only thing anybody's going to want to know about this era is why did we fail in that? You know, nobody's going to care about, about Trump or China or, you know, any other issue. This is the only one they're going to care about. And so, you know, part of what I'm doing is, you know, trying to figure out, you know, is there a political opening? You know, can enough pressure be put on so that there's serious policies that are going to reduce and eventually end CO2 emissions? You know, where is there a political opening? What strategy can be most effective? These sound like fascinating projects, and I especially enjoy this POW as a, uh, as a sort of framing device to explore this issue around American hesitance around body count. So I'll look forward to seeing where that scholarship goes. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. It's great to talk with you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to New Books in History, a podcast channel on the New Books Network.